let's start the show with uh, our guest, Raymond Lowe. He is the OpenVINO Edge AI software evangelist at Intel. You got the whole thing. He has a great- got the whole thing, right. <laughs> oh, I, I got all of them. OpenVINO Edge AI software evangelist at Intel. Done. Right. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, Ray, Ray, Raymond has a great uh, life story. I mean, he started as, uh, as an entrepreneur and is uh, now at Intel. So we will go over his life story. Let me actually hand over this talk to Raymond. The, you know, after we go over uh, the things that Raymond has done, we are going to go over a tutorial on how to train a neural network model and then deploy it on an edge device. So start to finish, a very informative, um, uh, this is going to be very informative. So let's get started. And uh, we will Again. also be doing Q and A at the end of the session. Don't forget folks. Mm -hmm. That is right. And um, what are the uh, what, what what are we giving away, uh, Phil? Today, today, you will have the opportunity to win a wonderful new era Open Vino hooded sweatshirt, similar to the one, in fact, exactly like the one that Ray is wearing. Yes, exactly this one. <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's get started, uh, Ray. It's all yours. Well, thank you again. Thank you very much for inviting me over today. So I'll start sharing my screen. Let me know when it's ready. Yeah, it's there. All right. So again, to iterate on today, this will be a very hands-on, a lot of tutorial section. I got to walk through source code with you. And the reason I really enjoy doing what I'm doing today is really back to my backstory. But let's go through this quickly, <laughs> part of the Intel. <laughs> um, I really want to introduce myself as a journey, you know, like for the last 15 years, I would say I obsessed with computing in certain interesting way. And why I say that is, well, back in school, I would say back in school 10, 15 years ago, when I was working on my PhD study, I always loved to put things on wearable computing on, on the actual human body, like wearable computing. And that's where I did my thesis. So I worked with NVIDIA, Google at that time as an internship to build basically like 3D sensor technology. Before you guys thought about 3D sensing at the time, you know, the Kinect, I was building those on wearable devices. Um, why I care about that is I think there's a connection between human, machine and AI in some weird way. I'll say weird way, because that time I don't understand what's the best way that this will come together in the industry. That's why I took this to Silicon Valley. I found a company. So I was like, okay, last year of PhD, I have two choices, get dropped out, or get a company or get graduated. So a free choices. So I took the risk. I went all the way to Silicon Valley, joined my combinator and start a company called Meta. It's an augmented reality company where we build headset. And you may have heard about us from like TED Talk at one point. So it was like on stage basically with my co-founder and doing holographic, kind of, I will say holographic, uh, but interface where we collaborating remotely. And now I wish I had that so I can see you all like remotely with me. <laughs> <laughs> so like a big audience group. But more importantly, this whole experience of me building two products, right? I was a product like CTO, I was CTO and co-founder of the company. I really obsessed with customer and product. Brought me a lot of understanding, okay, building products not easy, especially with software and hardware integrations. Then I went to Harvard. I work on a medical startup because I think there's a missing puzzle. I want something small that I can wear every day where it can connect to my brain. So that was my thesis at that time. But during that time, there's something happened to my family that I have to move to a corporate. And my first corporate job were Samsung. I was there doing distributed computing. And that was very fun because we think about Airbnb for computing. So think about every Samsung phone, you can write a little job like a dispatcher. So you can run like billions of things at one point, a billions of things at one point. That was really interesting. But after COVID, I have to move to Google. So it's a long story for me. Um, I went to Google for a short time before I joined Intel. But this is the important part, why I'm here today. Today I'm here because I believe there's a great opportunity where people can learn AI in a much simpler way. My journey was a lot of pain. And one thing I learned about pain is if someone walked through it once, you don't have to do it. <laughs> That's why we're here. Today I'm gonna show you all the things you shouldn't be doing and should be doing that will save you time. But if you find something new, I'm more than happy to listen because we have a forum and ways of discussion you can tell us, get feedback. 
But in Intel, I'm the evangelist. I actually help Intel to teach other about something called Open Fino, which you will learn today. So why I care about this so much? Because personally, I felt this every day when I build AI tools. Yeah, you've seen all of this when you think about any project. Like, uh, error. Cannot find a version that certifies, certifies the requirement. The dependency is not matching. Well, even I think everyone knows this. Doesn't matter what open source you use, you have that problem. Operating system not supported is like, uh oh, right? Uh, and then the worst is like someone did open source push just six years ago. Like, where's the person? Where's the person? Like, just like, does still exist? The person doesn't even want to work on it. And last but not least, there's a lot of hardware dependencies when it comes to developing these kind of solutions. And today, I'll say don't give up when you see those things because I want to provide you a better path. Remember my journey, like I walk a lot of paths. I want to provide you a path that's one page that you can just take home and you can use later in your journey. And how does it work? First, let's talk about what OpenFino is in a nutshell. You think about today, if you're in the AI industry using OpenCV or no, OpenCV, uh, well, could be OpenCV by the way, uh, TensorFlow, Onyx, PyTorch, all these open source library that the AI frameworks, they all come with some sort of model, some sort of like results, right? They are like very great for that. Intel take that, like basically you take the pre trained model and we help you to optimize it to run on different hardwares. And not only optimize for different hardware, but optimize better for each of the hardware. For example, when we think about a customer using it, they basically run the script and then boom, 2x sometimes. And that's like something you shouldn't skip. It's free guys, right? It's optimized, it's better. Accuracy is retained in a very comparable way. I shouldn't say perfect, but at least for most of the application I've seen in the industry, people love it. And then it's cross-platform. You don't have to deal with Linux, Mac, Windows problems. And these kind of like large sets of hardware capability with all billions of devices. So as long as you write it correctly once, whatever you learn today, you can expect billions of people, or also not people, but billions of devices be able to use this exactly. And there's no need to rewrite. So why I care this is today I'm gonna to teach you how to go from end to end. Because in inference, like that's what we call, there's a step called training before you do that. Inference means, think about like you have a picture of a banana. Is it a banana? You ask a question to the machine. The machine classifies it as a banana. That's an inference step. It's like predicting <laughs> to get what that says. Any questions so far? Like you guys look, mm, all right. I can stop at any time. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, oh my God, sure. So, but for training to inference, this step is very important because a lot of people may only do one side and the other side. So I want people to basically learn end to end today. So when I think about training, it's like you have a neural network. Think of a neural network, it's like the little brain, it's kind of brain, I call the brain, have a lot of knobs so you can tune. So whenever you're trying to train a network, you feed an example, and that's a four, you propagate through the network and you tune the knot to basically handle each of the case. Again, feel free to read more books on this. I can definitely point you to that. But the most important part is this process will always end you with something called the model, right? We talk about pre-trained model. Think about it's like a little black box to me sometimes. It's like you will get a binary file that explain to you, like if you have some input, what the output will look like. Why it's important to you is you think of applications like the basic one, like I talk about banana, bicycle, you can do predictions, right? That's one of the very powerful use case we see. And then in OpenFino, we go beyond. We have like many different things like post estimation. We have like interesting thing. I'll show you in the demo. So I'm not gonna talk about it yet. So, and more importantly today, I gotta go directly to the question. I gotta show you how to build an image classifier of a flower. I got to make the new network to recognize this real flower today. It's like a magic show. Yes, it is. Uh, and how, I'm going to show you how to create the pre-trained model and then how you actually use the predictor output with the depth AI as the ultimate goal. But let's start with like, what's the tool look like? Because like, uh, looks really good. Like, how do I start? So to get started, today I'll teach you the one pager. I love one pager. One pager means like one page that has everything. If you screenshot this, pretty much you can run what I have today, okay, on your machine. And assume you have Python. And assume that it's like something you should have by today, right, developers? If not, let me teach you how to do as well. But let's do a demo, and then I'll switch my screen right now, and then hold on for one second. 
So, all right. Are you ready? Oop. All right. So let's start with the GitHub. So today I'm going to teach you about all the material in this GitHub. And we already shared that in the webman uh, email. You can just click on this. So uh, let me walk through we, the steps here. Yep. We can also share it uh, right now with uh, people, all the three URLs. Um, that Way ahead of you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. And again, feel free to ask questions, everyone. This should be interactive in any way. If you stop me, I'll help you to answer some of the questions here. Sounds good, guys. All right. So now this notebook is the core of everything we got to teach today. It's a way that we simplify the workflow. Remember I talked about is so fragmented. So instead of that, we provide you one pager that you go through end to end that oh, will run. You don't have to think about. And I explain how it works right now. First, to get started, as I have a CPU, 64 bits, you have Linux, Mac, and then Python, you're good to go. And this is a list of things that we support already. So for you as a developer, you know that your friends can run it most likely, right? That's the step one, right? You want your friends to run it. Step two is like the installation step. I'm gonna explain a little bit. So basically what it does is it will clone the repository, but we create something called a virtual environment. And I'll explain why this is important is by doing this, now encapsulating your work into a sandbox. And this step is amazing. Lifesaver, guys. Remember my all the steps so far? People that that AI development don't do this. You gotta strangle them. It was like, guys, please sandbox your stuff. So you don't conflict with other projects. And once you activate the environment, what it means is um, I can run some of the steps later. Uh, if you have any trouble, run it. Uh, we have a web minute behind the installation. So today I will focus on the actual code rather than just installation. But the most important is we have something called the pip install with the requirement.exe. This is an extremely important step. Why? Because by doing this, I'll explain. This step, basically use this requirements.exe and then install all the prerequisites. Think about this as like an Android Studio or IDE that basically you double click and run your apps kind of thing. That's like a new thing to us because back then to run an AI project, it's like, okay, have you done all this dependencies check? Okay, here, have you installed all the open source library? Here, have you test against all of your environments? Now you don't. You will basically forget it, you know? And once you have that installed, now this is the part that is quite interesting. You launch the interface. So you basically run Jupyter Lab notebooks. And when you do that, I will show you my big screen. So when you do that, you basically get into this. So I basically did exactly all the steps. At this final step, I run it. Then it will pop up, don't worry about this fall for you pop up with this. And voila, you will get into something called a Jupyter Notebook. So today I will basically introduce this session. It's called TensorFlow Training. So when you open it on the left side, you will be seeing a set of demos. And let's do the one demo first so you can see how it runs before I jump directly into the training. On this interface, when you say run, run also, it works. That's how it is. You don't have to think about all the issues like, uh, do you have the library? Because we already have everything installed. So how does it work? In this Hello World, we basically show you how to import OpenCV, import some of the basic libraries, but most importantly, import the OpenPhino library. Remember the inference engine I talked about after you want to, let's say, do it inference step. Next step is you know the network. So this is something called the pre-trained model we talked about. And now it point at CPU, but you can point it on like the neural stack, for example, here. Or you can point it on different things that actually runs the same way. Then lastly, you do something called the lower image. So what it does is like you now actually load, but you have to reshape it. So the network has explicit size about like what it will take. So this is something you can find out from our documentation. So if you click on this, it will talk about the input, right? So that's why we call it the 224. If you look at this, it's a classifier. It tells you the gigaflop, like basically the, like how much of the computation you'll need to get it done. But most importantly, it also tells you like, okay, the size, what's the input it takes, right? Uh, what format it takes. It's a little bit tricky in the beginning, but the key thing is in this notebook, we explain it to you end to end and you see 224, oh, that's what it means. And why we shape it this way. And that's why, that's why, right? You see the RGB. 
So we basically have all the documentation in one page, right? And you have the Google and do the Stack Overflow. Now at this point, when you finish this step, you actually recognize this doc as the flat code retriever. And that's correct. That was my uh, coworker's doc. We've been borrowing her forever. So she's our model in our setup. But after the hollow world, let's go directly to training. Any questions so far, anyone? Well, uh, we'll do questions, uh, uh, broader questions at the end of the session. Um, but yeah, feel okay. free to, if anything isn't clear in the, we'll ask a question in the chat and I'll uh, try to stay on top mm -hmm. of that as well. Right, and then uh, people ask like 3.9. Yes, I'm working on it. So I see some of your questions, great questions. Stop me anytime because I would like to help all of you if I can. All right, so now at this step, let's talk about training. All right, take a deep breath. This is a big page and then we're gonna get ready. So at least at this point, we know in less than 10 minutes, you have your environment set up and you're ready to go. So now I'm gonna go through this entire big page and explain how I go from training to deployment using TensorFlow. Why this is important to you is this, most likely you'll cross this path once in your life. Why I say that is you will end up have to have take a model, but you want to train it the way you need it to. And more importantly, you want to deploy it, right? And that's how usually when we do with a lot, a lot of company, that's the workflow they need. So this one is based on something called the image classification from TensorFlow tutorial. For most of you that haven't seen the tutorial, I'll quickly walk through what this is doing. But you have done it, bear with us, because I want all the audience to see what's happening here. So this is based on that. So what this image classification training is about is to basically take a set of pictures here. Um, it is basically right now I choose flower. Um, and from the flower set, uh, you have to basically find a way to massage the data. Massage means like you want to make sure you get the right size of it for the input. You want to make sure that it's do some sort of data augmentation. We're going to talk about that and make sure that it will fit into the, into the neural network such that it can be trained. So let's talk about how it works. First, this is all the import. So this is based on the TensorFlow, right? And then we're using the Keras model, the sequential one. Again, this is like a toy story, a toy story, toy example. Don't take it like as like the ultimate, but it may solve a lot of problems you wanna try in the early days. So first, memorize that guy, his hints for you. We start with the flowers, right? So for the industry people like here today, you always have this problem. You may have something like a set of things you wanna like recognize or objects you wanna recognize or things that is the objective for your use case for your business. You start with your data set. So in this case, we have five things. So we have daisy, dandelion, roses, sunflower, tuplets. These are the input that we have. Now the next step is when we have this input, what this tutorial is showing is, okay, actually I can run the whole thing. Uh, it's kind of risky because it's gonna burn my machine. I'm gonna run it, doesn't matter. So I gotta run step-by-step. Step. So when you run this, it will download the data set and then it will start to extract all this. As you can see right now, that's an example of a rose. So the data set is quite interesting. If you read the data set, they don't just take pictures from Wikipedia of what exactly a rose is, but they have some contextual side of it. Like it can be a rose in a scene. Uh, it can be like, uh, let's think about Flickr photos. That's how they actually put this together. And the nice thing about what I'm showing is you can download this and see like the data set and where it comes from and then read it behind it. Because at the end of the day, I got to show you why some of the problem exists due to the data set. So once you have the data, you extracted it and you can see, okay, these are all the inputs, right? So what happened is, they use something called the pre-processing. That is the very important step. And that also determined your pre-trained model. Remember I talked about the input problem. Now you're defining what the input will look like for your pre-trained model. How do I decide this? A lot of guessing in the beginning. I really be honest, a lot of guessing in the beginning. So you may basically do, do two or three different sizes uh, depending on your use case. Um, is a trade-off? Yes. When the, when the picture is way too big, let's say the model is really big, now you're trading. This is a very important step. You're trading between accuracy sometimes, like for the use case, and overfitting. It may be like 
it only fit in certain ways so that your neural network is too specific. So it cannot handle generalizations. So this is a step that I would say you should play with. If you download what we have today, play with this and see what the graph will look like and what happens to it, right? Uh, when, you, when you train it differently with different size of images. And now that batch size and all this, so that I think you can ignore for now, but important thing is understanding what the input is will save you a lot in the long run. Whew. So again, I gotta go a little bit faster now, looking into the data. So if you look at the data set, basically now we are recognizing all this, but for a moment, I would like to show you guys some of the tricks they have done in this tutorial. So the batch and all that, don't worry about it, but the key is, that I think today we're not gonna talk performance too much, but the key right now is this part. I gotta create, all right. So this part, I'll say a little bit too deep for today. So this one, I will have a separate tutorial on how we create a model. This one, I'll say in a short term is, you have to understand your use case first. So in this case, we're building a new network for classification, right? We have different layers. The layers is like, um, Think about like the input in between how this neural network will navigate to get your answers. This is a lot longer. I will recommend a course on it, but I want to point out one thing that they have done really smart and you have to think about every time you train your data. I got to skip scrolling. This is the problem called overfitting. I think this is often got ignored and not even looked at. So what happened is when you have a data like that and you're not having a lot of data. You have only 3,000, 6,000 images. They're not big numbers. Um, you will notice when you're fitting your information, you get like saturated very quickly. It doesn't go very far. And why did that happen? Um, this is something called the overfitting because every image representation of a rose is done by only one image, right? So you have only like maybe hundred of like sample of this one of that, like say category. And if there's any variance in, let's say, when I take a picture of a picture of the rose slightly differently, the new network won't be able to pick it up because it doesn't have the enough example. And now I, this is uh, step. Yep. I have uh, one little, you know, analogy to give uh, while thinking about overfitting. So uh, everybody remembers, you know, the kid in your school who used to get better grades than you, uh, perhaps, but by memorizing stuff. So they would do very well uh, by memorizing uh, the material instead of understanding it, right? And the same thing happens with neural network. If the neural network has the capacity and the data set is small, it will memorize everything, right? So it will do very well on things that it, it has seen, but it would not generalize very well. So it would, if you give it a new picture, it may not do as well uh, as on the training set. So you will see this weird thing that it does so well on the training set, but as soon as you give it something new, it doesn't do very well, right? Perfect. So we say that it has overfitted or it has failed to generalize, right? Yes. What we want is, you know, it's it should be like a smart kid who has understood the concepts and not really memorized the material. And that's what overfitting is. Yeah, exactly. I love your example. I gotta tell my kids about this kiss thing. <laughs> Don't <laughs> overfit yourself right now. Generalize your thinking. That's a smart one. That's a good one. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, neural network, human brain. There's a lot of similarity if you think about it later. Uh, I love your example. But this is exactly where um, we do something called a data augmentation in this example. Um, how you generalize it? Well, one example is like you ship a little bit flip the image a little bit up and down, left and right. And more importantly, maybe rotate a little bit. So you get a little bit of rotational invariance. So you think about like, now you have one image, but now you have like nine or 10 representation of the same image in a way that is more generalized. So again, this is not like optimal in some way. I'll say if you wanna like be very rigid about use cases because it doesn't handle all the transition in a camera, right? Like you only handle the L fine but perspective and all that we didn't handle. But given this situation, I think it's very adequate. But if it's depending on your use case, your accuracy. But now I think the other thing is um, they have anything called the dropped out. And today I cannot walk through all of them, sorry guys. I wanna go directly to the open Fino side because I'm ready. Remember I was running this code. I wanna go directly to, okay. So it's been through a lot of training already. So in the 
So right now I'm in the last bit of the training. So you can see right now I'm running on a CPU, by the way. So this whole thing will run about five minutes, 10 minutes maximum. Uh, so you can basically, if you don't have a GPU today, don't get discouraged. You can still do this. Uh, and I got to show you something called a collab today. So you can also run it on a collab. Collab basically is a Google virtual machine that you can run with a GPU. Uh, it's in the link. Uh, but that one, you can basically run this a little bit faster on a remote access. But now you have a problem. It's not on your machine. You make sure you get good network. You don't get dropped. Uh, you don't accidentally lose your network. So there's some problem with that if you're using remote access. So once this is done, um, I think this is important to look at this graph. So a lot of us, like when we finish, we do, what, we have something like this, like you have the accuracy, like for instance, just training. And this usually is your first gut feeling. I got a gut feeling how well this is performing. Gut feeling is like, uh, okay. It's at least it's like not tailored off at like 50%, right? Not like 20%. At least when it tests against your pre-trained data, the training data, it's doing some work that is not like flat out very early. So I, I comment out of chunk that flat out early because of today, I want to show the data augmentation side. So at the top part tonight, if you're interested, you can uncomment these and take a look at the results, how much we improve by doing this step. All right, so a lot of teaching happened today. Why do I care so much about this step? Because now you are a little bit more familiar with the basics, but more importantly, now you're ready to take a model to open Fino. This is the step I really think you guys should like, guys, we're not done. You know, oftentimes when I look at the industry, here's like, hey, I got a nice graph, game over. No, <laughs> right? No, no, we're not there yet. Like we have to think about users. Like how can I deploy to thousands of people, millions of people? So from the training to this step is often where you get a lot of things from the industry. You get something like a pre-trained model. And from here, I got to save a pre-trained model, right? So this is the step I was like doing, save the pre-trained model. So when you do that on your left side, you can see you have this, this is the pre-trained model. And you have some of the variable, variable thing, and then assets is empty. But this is the folder, but this is the binary that you always want to keep once you finish training. Because why this is important is this next step is where we take this one step further and convert it. Remember the open window in a nutshell? This is step we take to say, okay, we got to convert it to something called an IR format. IR format, I think it's intermediate representation. I really forgot for a second. But that step is where it allow you to run on all the hardware and faster. And I didn't benchmark on this one, but I'll show you the benchmark of running this versus the original. You usually get at least like one to two X, uh, 1.5 to two X easily. And that's a lot. Think about like for a core core machine, you've got a core kind of performance. Think about that as a big deal. So now what happened is, we have something called the model optimizer. We run this step. You basically run through it end to end. And what this step is doing is it will take the model input and you convert it. Again, I'm showing you this. You got you got a lot of learning in one minute, but we document the heck of it so you can at least know what's going on. But once you run it, what, what's important to you is these two files. If this like fire.ir or flower dot bin and then flower.xml. These are the one that you can share to people. Think about you can copy and paste this. Like these are the binary, you can give it to your friends. It can run basically just on that. These are the pre-trained model graphs. And lastly, the example is we're gonna basically run it by loading the network. Remember the hollow world, same code, same structure. You can, I actually show you, this is how you run it on Neurostack. Actually, I can even try to run on Neurostack later, uh, but here, a newer stick, I can puck it in. I don't have a USB port now. It's funny. I use up all of them. <sighs> all right, I'll show that right after. I'll follow up with me. But this is exactly all it takes to toggle between hardware. You want to, let's say, run it on VPU. That's it, one extra line of code. Then last and not least, you run this final step and you will get a result. Whew. So that was like a really long 10 minutes walkthrough. Any <laughs> questions here? I would like to add one uh, one other thing. Uh, if you go back to the model optimizer step, there are yes. a few things uh, going on there. Um, you know, 
the model that you produce uh, during training, it is uh, very bloated in the sense that, you know, it has a lot of information that you don't need during inference. For example, it may have gradient information. You throw that mm -hmm. away and the model size uh, falls down immediately. And right. the second thing is that uh, it is also not optimized for the particular hardware that you want. Here, for example, uh, if you look at the IR data type, it says FP16. So what it has done is that all the, the model was trained using you know 32-bit floating point or 64-bit floating point. And now the data, you don't need that level of precision, especially when the hardware could support floating point 16 uh, calculation. So you can actually make things much faster by just changing the quantization from you know 64-bit or 32-bit you change it to 16 bit and suddenly not only that the model size uh, decreases you it also becomes faster to run so these mm -hmm. kinds of optimizations and there are tons of these i'm just you know picking the easiest ones to explain but there are a ton of these optimizations that openvino does for you and uh, just from my personal experience in our consulting um, we actually uh, got about 3x performance boost uh, by just running it through the uh, OpenVINO optimizer. And it makes such a big difference because this application was for a video background removal and something that runs at 30 frames a second versus 10 frames a second, the difference is huge, right? Uh, so that's uh, that's something the team, my team was convinced about OpenVINO when uh, that happened. Uh, you know, they did so many optimizations, but then the final step, just run it through OpenVINO uh, model optimizer and get uh, get an optimized model. Exactly. Uh, I, I'm glad that you love it. To point out that exactly what we have done, we also open source and also published paper on all the steps we have done, uh, including like we talk about quantization, polarization, spiritus. So many things we did to basically trim it down and make sure that we can run optimally on various hardware. And then this all can be found on our GitHub. So that's the one of the big reason why today I'm pushing people to the GitHub to take a look. Uh, and again, this is very technical, very detailed. It's not user-friendly by definition, uh, but it will answer a lot of your technical questions if you're interested in any of that. Sounds good? Yeah. Thank you again for that. And not, now I'm not done yet. Um, for a fence user, you may be like, Ray, that's too easy, right? I want something more advanced tonight. Here you go, right? I have something called a training extension which I did a webinar about a month ago. You can Google me up. But I explained to people that if you want to go really beyond on the training, again, uh, I want to show you all the things we support. Pick one of those, see if we can replicate the work on the training side. So these ones are not as simple to use. Like the one I show you were one page on a simple environment. This one is for hardcore users that want to like get very deep into like the bare bone basic of it. But from our engineer, from I'll say Russians, they actually give you all this packages right now. They document all the steps. For example, more particularly, I was doing the this one. So I gave a webinar to explain how you can basically replicate this work. And this work is, uh, oh, I don't have a picture. Uh, but this one is, is fun. I just, I can only say to you guys, this is fun. This is the one called text spotting. So you, ba so basically you look at some text, and figure out where they are, like you know how, like in a scene where the actual, you know, the miracle are things like that. So let's go back to again. This is like interesting links I'll share. Remember, my job is to give you the journey I walk through at Intel. Last eight months was intense. It was intensive work I was trying. So thank you for the optimizer. But why is it important to you right now? Because like once you have done this step you are in a little bit of a better shape, I will say. Think about you working out. Now your model is like bust, like, like boosted. Uh, and why I call that amazing to you today is you can transfer the same learning to different models. For example, today, I have something, the 3D dog. I, I, it's like model dev on uh, OpenFino, right? So what it does is now you can look at a 2D image and extract the 3D image out from it. And I can run it right now to show you like real time. See, I actually don't do anything new. I run it like an SDK, like run or sell, and all of this will execute. And you can start learning about, okay, 
how do I do model that with a pre-trained model this time? So we provide this model, by the way, it's from Intel. So we provide even the paper if interest. So if you click on this, you will basically get to the publications and see how we actually did this. And the PDF is there, it's free to download. But more importantly is everything we learned so far. Remember we talked about we import OpenCV. Remember we talked about importing OpenPhino. Same story. Once you've learned that, you see, okay, it looks familiar now. Devices, yeah, CPU, I'm using a model. I am gonna do, I gotta load the model and I'm gonna basically also load the image. All this step you learn are transferable. Remember how in the beginning I say, AI is fragmented. I almost assume that every time you learn one thing from one project, you don't transfer to the next project. And that's one thing you want to avoid because it feels like you never finish. You never learn enough because everyone's doing it differently. And hopefully by doing this template, I encourage the industry to, let's do it proper so it's maintained. So why it's important to you right now is you run it the same way. Instead of getting a dog classified as like a golden retriever, you get an output image. So think of a neural network is not limited to only, I'll say, I shouldn't just say neural network, but this kind of like AI system in general, we're not limited to only text, but we are okay to do beyond just text. We have super resolution, for example, and things like that. And now with this, you have a 3D information extracted from the scene. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but a lot of open CV stuff. So any open CV fans here, you should know it. Um, <laughs> We use a lot of OpenCV uh, as a backend as well. So I love it, by the way, guys. It's mostly like the, the, all the pain are gone because of OpenCV wrap around all this. And the installation was easy. Uh, but as you can see, we were able to get 27 FPS on my little CPU and be able to extract the 3D scene information out of a video. And you see, you can see the results directly in the browser. And to me, amazing. And last but not least, I'll run one last demo. You see how I do demo now? Toggle. And I don't even have to think. I just like run, run ourselves, and let it do its work. But now I can refill the code. It's like, okay, this time I will do background removal. And this is my last demo for the notebook. And it was like, okay, so this one, I'm not going to go through everything. This should bring home exercise, guys. But what, why it's important to you is if I scroll all the way down, like everything looks similar, similar, similar. Loading the model, CPU, runtime, all that, measuring, but you put a network in, but the key is when you get the output. Yes. Now think about you can make memes, guys. You can do anything now. This is such a high quality Photoshop playful thing. And we did a fun thing. So we put our dog Coco in Hollywood to China. <laughs> can you tell the difference? <laughs> So I don't know, it looks pretty good. Uh, so I don't think Coco ever been to China, but we now have a China Coco I can give to my China team. So to me, it's fun. I find like, instead of let's say fiddling with requirements, today I'm fiddling with nothing but one page and the same interface. And to me, it's a huge uptake uh, in the beginning at Intel. And today is something you can download and use um, all right, I gotta stop for one second. I gotta switch to the last demo and we'll take some questions. So it's a, it's a great thing for people who are just beginning, right? Just go through these Python notebooks and you learn a lot by just going through it, looking at the comments and running it, executing it. And if you want to use Google Colab, it will speed up things uh, tremendously for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, in exactly. terms of training. Um, yeah, so the last demo is for, uh, OpenCV AI kit? Yes. So I will again share my screen again. This one, to surprise guys, I haven't tested fully. So this is a surprise to everyone. If it works well, give me a clap. If it doesn't work, I took risk, guys. I took risk for everyone. <laughs> We're doing it live. I love it. Yes, it's live. So before I start, I would point out like where things are. Remember, I'm teaching you all like where things are so you don't get lost. So very quickly, I got to share my screen first again. All right, uh, hold on, hold on. Where's my share screen? Uh, hold on, make sure I, ooh, I'm sharing something correctly, hold on. All right, it should be live now. Is it working? Yep. 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 Why I teach that so hard today is 
everything we talk about today is reusable and applicable to different ways. This is Colab. Think about this as like a notebook, but now it's hosted on Google. So now I say connect here, you get a GPU. So that's one way that, okay, Ray, I want to go more advanced. I want to use GPU. Okay, go for it, right? If you don't want to pay for your GPU, which is impossible to buy these days anyway. So, well, that's why I use CPU sometimes. So back to this, if you grow, scroll through this, I use the exact same example. Why do that? So that you can understand the flow. So remember all this? Okay, we are expert now. We know exactly care of pre-processing. I got to skip scrolling fast. Now you got to do exact same thing. Oops, sorry, why did I close it? But the important part is, remember I didn't show this before the data augmentation was really bad. And then after the data augmentation, the accuracy is a lot better. So that's the graph I didn't show. Now the last bit. Hey, I want to deploy it on this today. You see this, my little baby? Oh, this is so good. This is one of the best camera ever. You have in feed, like you have this. And the webcam combined it with a super good software. I'm not selling guys, I love it. That's why I'm saying it. These two combined it in a way that you can do like all this AI stuff in real time with the hardware acceleration. So again, I got to show a demo of this today. That's the OpenCV AI kit. Uh, yes, uh, I have a box. Yep, so oh, I, I'm like your evangelist right now. I'm not kidding guys, this Thank is you. super good. <laughs> all right, so again, I only speak on what I believe. Uh, in general, so no nothing crazy here. But now I'm showing you this collab, but why I point back to this is because we don't have the notebook environment that's set up, now you have to, in the collab, you have to install the whole open thing now. But at least I give you one page that works. So this is all the like detail behind it. But most importantly to you right now is this extra step. Remember we learned how to convert a pre trained model in IR format. I did one extra step called the the blob format. This format is like explicitly designed for the GPU so that you can deploy it onto the hardware. Again, we spend enough time to figure out that script so you don't have to go back and see how it works, but at least you have a line of code here to show you, okay, you gotta take this compiler. This is the compiler basically, don't worry about the front. And you take the input. I have a 32, uh, 32 bit version of that floating point. Uh, and then you want to basically convert it down. And then when it finish, you get something called the flower.bob. And that's a file that actually the pre trained model now. It's just have a different name. Okay, think this way. All right, so once you have this, I download everything. And these are all portable. Again, you can give it to your friends, you can test it out. I'm gonna run my final demo. Okay, this is the final final guys. Ooh, I'm, I'm worried. And let's do it. All right. All right, so this is executing and the screen is up on the other side. I got to pull it in. All right, so from this, we got like this right now, it pointing at like everything is dandelion. I can explain why everything is dandelion. But most importantly right now, you're looking at this scene. I'm a rose. Yes, it works. It's very good too, 98%, 95%. So this new network is recognizing the rose pretty well. And drop it, I'm a dandelion. And I'll explain why I'm a dandelion later, okay? And it's not fair high accuracy. So we can do something called a thresholding. So if things are below 80%, maybe it's just a, called a misclassifying, like false positive. Um, so these are the things that you have to think about once you have a network. Remember, we never say we're done until this. You have to test it. I'm testing it live, guys. Oh, okay, I gotta take a, take a picture of this for my boss right now. I've never done it, so. All right, that's good. <laughs> All right, so uh, give me some screenshot, guys. I, I mean it. It's 99 here? Okay, that's good, thank you. All right, so, so with this right now, I show you, uh, okay, I work with Rose or Dandelion. Can I do more? Yes, so I gotta point it at my screen right now. Okay, this is my live session. You can see actually that's my camera. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so the important thing is, let's try some extra photo. And today I gotta show you if it can recognize. All right, this is, if people in California should know this flower, but it recognize it in a way that is close enough. And this is our star Coco again. So I wanna make sure that she's everywhere in our tutorial. But as you see, 
now we classify three things already. Rose, then the lion. Then there's two more Then I'm not gonna talk about. You should, if you watch our tutorial, you should know, because that will be our question for today. What am I gonna classify the next two? All right, that's it for that. And it ran. And I'll go back to my slide deck right now. All right, uh, to summarize. Any questions so far? I think, yeah, go ahead and do your summary and we'll open, I'll uh, ask some questions afterwards. Perfect. So I got to summarize what you learned today. Um, again, I show a very long page of everything, but in short, if you into AI today, you're working with TensorFlow, I'll give you a path up from training all the way to deployment. If you don't want to work on training, you can also work on OpenFino if you grab the pre-trained data. So for example, today, with all the stuff you learn, you can now look at any TensorFlow code, right? Like this, right? This is a TensorFlow code. Uh, you look at it, you understand how it works. You have a pre-trained model, you have a pre-processing pre -processing loop or something, and you have an inference steps. That's how usually you will see it when it comes to some sort of, um, let's say image classification step, but it's generalizable for many things. You still have these kind of stuff. But more importantly now is the workflow looks like this. To open Fino is nothing more but changing the model in the middle. You're still learning the same thing. So you're not like restarting your life, which is something I want to afford. When I do my PhD, I restart too many times, guys. I have two different pieces, basically. Don't do that. So <laughs> it was painful. But it was good. I learned a couple of things, so, but don't do that. Uh, by doing this, right now, you go to the notebook. Like you learn all this. You go to the notebook, GitHub. You download, install. Now you have the same learning platform I really recommend you all do. Please watch it and start it if you're there. It helped a lot because it, know, it give us like feedback to say if you guys enjoy it or not enjoying it. And if you enjoy it, put a comments, discussion, and tell us what you need. Because right now we're gonna put it on many different people. Teachers will use it, everyone will use it. Your feedback can influence the future. That's how it should be, guys. You're changing the world, guys. This is it, okay? And last but not least, Go to the Dev AI experiments. I was doing exactly that experiment just now. I was scared. It's experimental. <laughs> I mean it, guys. What we just showed was in there. I published that already. So you can find out this work called Generation 2 um, of that. And then it's uh, image classification. I wrote that example for you all months ago. I tested with the engineer. Took me months, guys. Months. Not kidding. Months. So you're taking the benefit of the months from me again. So take that. And these will give you a lot of heads up in the industry. And again, I'm from Intel and hope you all learned something today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raymond. Uh, it, was, it was really good. And the more important thing I think is, uh, you know, the material that you have uh, produced, it's very difficult to go over all the material in detail uh, in a you know, 40 minute webinar. So I highly recommend that people go and check out those notebooks, especially if you're a beginner and see the various steps where all the comments, et cetera, are written in great detail. And mm -hmm. you will learn a lot uh, from, you know, training all the way to deployment, right? And yes. that's, uh, I, I believe that's uh, a great resource that you have shared uh, from Thank Intel. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, you, do you have a question, Phil, uh, for today's uh, giveaway? And then uh, we will uh, take questions. Yeah, I do. Uh, so folks, we're, we're going to be giving away the first person to answer correctly. The trivia question I'm about to ask will get a open vino hoodie from Ray. Can you show the, yeah, there we go. Yep. That's right. I have to stand up almost. This is like extremely high quality. I'm not going to talk about the brand too much, but it cost me too much. Uh, so I really recommend you to really try it. And this is limited quantity. So you're one of the maybe hundreds of people in the world have it. That's all. Great. It's more Great. expensive than a luxury brand. Trust me. Did you also try, did you also try modeling in your career? Uh, I would love to. I, I've, I've been doing workout. <laughs> Just need, you need right. another job. You haven't had enough yet. Yeah. <laughs> I have to have okay. too many jobs at one point. You're right. It's funny though. Yes. So I'm listening. Um, the trivia question. Uh, again, the first person to answer correctly on my screen here will win one of these lovely open Vino hooded sweatshirts. Earlier, we showed you a collab notebook. There were five different flowers listed in there. What were those five flowers? 
Excellent oh, no. job copy pasting there, <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> Excellent job copy pasting, Thomas. Uh, Thomas Sh 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 Shirtle? I can't. It's the screen's moving that too fast. That fast? But yeah, you, like, you got for it. For one of a second? Yeah. That's a bot, copy, guys. Copy That's too fast. out of the notebook. I guess it just happened to be on the page, but you know, good, I see. good job. We'll, we'll count it. Good job. Um, All right. We'll contact you directly. You have to, we're going to make sure we share our contact. All right. Yep. Yep, we'll uh, right. make sure that we hook you up with Ray so you can get your free hoodie. Uh, thanks again, right. Ray. I'll it, hook you it, it up looks with awesome. The yeah. Center. Yep, thank you. So now the questions. Yes. Wow, so that was fast. Let's start with uh, somebody has a quest had a question about the uh, neural compute stick. What yes. what exactly? There, there's there's a two parter, I guess. First, what exactly mm -hmm. is is in the in, in neural compute stick? And also, can you run many of them in parallel? Right. Uh, again, so to me, I would say first, yes. The, the second part of the answer is yes, I have two of them already. This is not a box. There's anyone in there. You can, I saw people run four of them in parallel. That's pretty fun. They have a USB hub, they plug it in. You have to make sure they are powered properly. They are approximately five watt max, I think, with a hit sink on the side. So the whole thing is a hit sink. So it, it runs a little bit warm. And what is it exactly? It's a, it's a custom, custom silicon that has Something called shavers. It's like designed for computer vision tasks. Um, so you can think about they're like, they're programmable chips, I'll say in this way in my head, that you can create pipelines so that you can make things run in parallel. So it's a complete different architecture than what we used to be seeing in a sequential way. So the, a lot of that happens um, in parallel inside. Um, how does it work exactly? I didn't build it. I don't want to lie to you guys. I didn't build it. Some in engineer built it. So I have to talk to the engineer for you. So, but what I understand is I have the whole documentation on the engine specification. And Brandon is like the king of this right now. Why I explain this, Brandon is the king. They are partner builders. So that's why I say buy this camera, you get more documentations in there because they actually document lots of it in there about the specification. Um, so I heavily recommend buying both of them to give it a try. But if, as of today, I, I'm not biased. I'll say these two serve a different purposes, right? This is great for uh, Raspberry Pi project. I was like, people plug it in for fun. This is great for Raspberry Pi project that has explicit use of this camera uh, as well. But this has a different form factor. So again, I'm not trying to lie, but this form factor may limit to some use cases, depending on you. They may have different camera lens system they need, like, you may want to use infrared instead of this. So there's like optimization of the hardware you will need. You may not want to buy this camera for that, but the company provide different solution. You can still like customize it. So right. it's really up to you how you want it. Uh, so that's how I see it. I will share the documentation on the actual thing. Uh, yeah. I didn't read the entire thing, but I can even point to the engineer who built it. Right. So the, uh, I mean, uh, I would like to add a little bit more. Um, the Neural Compute Stake basically has the same chip, Myriad X, which is also in Neurix, the right. AI kit, right? So both yes. of them share, and uh, Myriad X is basically, um, you know, a neural network accelerator, but it can also do a lot of computer vision uh, algorithms on the device itself, right? So uh, it can, it has these things called, uh, you know, the processing power it has about uh, four tops. It can be separated into doing neural networks, or it could also be used for doing some traditional computer vision algorithms like you know, detecting April tags, uh, motion detection, et cetera. So it's very customizable in that way. And both the neural compute stick as well as OpenCV AI kit have the same um, MediaDex chip. The difference is that in case of neural network, uh, in case of the neural compute stick, you plug it into your USB drive so there is a little bit of latency because the camera captures uh, the picture and then you load that frame onto the neural compute stick to do the inference. But on the other hand, uh, OpenCV AI kit, the camera is connected directly to the MediaDex chip. That way there is no latency. It's not going through the host to do this processing and whatever you have loaded on the new, uh, MediaDex chip that gets executed that neural network. So yeah, uh, basically, and uh, of course, uh, Ray will share all the hardware details, uh, but right. that's, that's the 30,000. That's perfect. Yeah, exactly. Latency is one of the big reasons why I switched to this from time to time for demo oh, so fast, right? And then <laughs> yes. also the software too. The software is a little bit different. So I, I always think about the end user side as a software too. 
Okay. Thanks for that. We've got yep. another question here about overfitting. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel that using pre-trained models kind of solves the problem of overfitting or mm. not really? No, I, like, no, yes, no, 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 no. As a, I, I would say no. I will say the, the thinking about that. Maybe I misunderstood what overthink, like overfitting he said there. But when we say overfitting in that sense is, you know, the moment you pre-train model is like the end results of the training. Think about this. Like pre-train means like you train something, pre-train, right? So the end results of, let's say, the new network, the, all this, like, you know, that whole, you know, the process of like training the data to the network. Once you get the output, the pre-trained model is at the end. I think is what, I don't know exactly what he means, by the way, but what I'm saying the overfitting happened there is because we, our images are not generalized enough that it will capture a lot of different variants, right? That's exactly what happened there. Uh, right there because this mm -hmm. is like not enough of them uh i think maybe what it's saying is like if we pre-massage the data like before coming in let's say you have the whole millions of uh, images from Flickr, maybe that will be less of an issue right so it, it has to like that duality of how, where the data is coming from how it's prepared uh but i would really recommend okay i keep saying it every day run the notebook you try it and play with it you get the results in five minutes, guys. Like this is the best learning tool I ever figure out. Usually I have a textbook to read hours before I get one thing running. So, so you have that luxury today that you don't have to take a class of like a year before you run one line of code that actually tests your assumptions. So please give it a try and let me know. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. It really like is amazing. To... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Satya. Uh, I, I would just like to add, uh, you know, uh, like I give that, give that analogy before, Overfitting is like memorization that you are memorizing the answers to what you are learning in the training set instead of generalizing the knowledge. So whatever makes you think makes things generalize will reduce overfitting. For example, mm -hmm. when we do data augmentation, you're taking an image and uh, you know changing it in a few different ways to create new images because a mirror reflection of a dandelion is still a dandelion, right? So we are teaching the neural network explicitly that, oh, don't think that these pixel values represent dandelion. It's the structure mm -hmm. that represents dandelion. So anything color that you're, too. yeah, the yeah, color, the color. Yeah, yeah. Those kinds of things, right? So you modify, you massage the data, you give it several examples where uh, you change the data in such a way that it tries to understand the underlying concept instead of trying to understand uh, the, you know, the pixels, right? Mm -hmm. That these pixels don't. And similarly, uh, sometimes you try to cripple the network in the sense that uh, this method called dro dropout, it uses only half the network because it's almost like, oh, you're, uh, the network is so fat. It, it has such a big learning capability that if you let it learn, it's going to memorize everything, right? So you cripple it uh, by using dropout, uh, in which case only half the network is used for uh, learning, right? Uh, so things like that. Uh, that's just a general idea. Mm -hmm. Great. And I think we've got yeah. we've got time for one more question here. Um, this one is about augmentation. Um, you touched on this a little bit in in your uh, presentation, but specifically, do you have any advice for how to optimize augmentation uh, rather than just doing everything? You know, throwing as many different versions as you can think of. That's an open-ended question, depending on the use case you might thinking. Uh, like why that works, I'll say why the augmentation works in that flower example just now, right? Let's explain that. And then we'll talk about more in depth how I would do it. The, the, the way I see that one is exactly what uh, Terry said. It's like you, have, you flip the image, it's still a dandelion. You, you like shift it a little bit, it's still a dandelion. So we introducing alpha and transform basically by definition, right? Into that uh, data set. So that is uh, when the camera is observing something, is has that invariance to it. So then um, that is one way to make sure the, the, the end result is like, if you think about neural network, they're pretty not smart. I don't know what's the best word for it. They, they literally like, you have the input, I observe it in some way, like the network we use, I should say. I just be very explicit. I'm using a toy example today. The one we have extremely, extremely dumb. Like basically you have all this like pixel, you line them up in a straight line, basically in some way sequentially, like, and then here's like all the observation, you pipe it through, 
then you get a likelihood, right? It's not that smart, like by definition. So when they when you make observation in a certain way, you only have one of those, that will get that ship up, let's say it has to be that one, right? And then you may not be able to like be able to generalize it, but that pixel has a dominant effect to the network, right? You want more of the observation of those like combination of the structure. If it was structure almost, you don't think of an individual picture, but like the structure of the pixel that if you ever watched like how the new network works as a visualizer, it's just like, whoop, it's like a bunch of electrons like, like going through and then whoops and then anger to one point, you know? So you think about that kind of like, like this whole big chunk of pixel concatenated and then get into one single output. So you want to avoid that kind of like one path is extremely strong as like a magnet pulling it into one answer. That's how I visualize it, but does it answer all the questions about that in general? I don't know yet because it's use case dependent and we have to study together. And my answer always is test and run it. <laughs> That's the best and best way because yeah, like having you that always close gotta loop. see it with your eyes to make sure it actually yeah, see works. It. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why I'm saying, guys, run my demo, notebook tonight. In five minutes, you'll learn a lot more than reading a hundred textbook. I, I really mean it sometimes. You have, can you can learn the textbook and try, learn the textbook and try. That close loop is I think is very powerful. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, I learned like a lot today. Um, can uh, you want to take us home, Satya? Yes. Satya. I, I want to add one more thing about augmentation. Uh, that uh, you know, what you have to take uh, some care about doing augmentation. And I say this because uh, when I was starting with neural networks, I got uh, burned with this uh, personally. So, for <laughs> example, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the the thing is, uh, uh, for example, a very common uh, kind of augmentation is flipping the image creating the mirror image. It's a valid augmentation for a lot of uh, examples, but imagine that you're trying to create a left-hand, right-hand classifier, right? Yes. And this is a mirror image of that, right? So if you do, if you augment all the right-hand images with uh, the mirror image, then you'd lost everything, right? So be very careful about data augmentation. It is absolutely required, but see what, you know, where it can uh, come and bite you for each augmentation, think carefully and say, oh, this augmentation makes sense for this data set mm -hmm. um, and this one doesn't. So uh, we are running out of time. Uh, that was yes. my little thing. Right. Um, uh, so I think I would uh, conclude with this. Uh, thank you so much, Raymond, for showing up uh, and uh, doing this uh, really nice presentation and putting together all the notebooks that people can go and try it out themselves. I uh, really mm -hmm. appreciate uh, you coming over here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Phil, as always. Yep. yep. Well, thank, thank you, you guys. I, um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We will be back here next Thursday, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter or follow us on LinkedIn. And thanks to this week's sponsor at OpenCV.ai, premier consulting services in vision and AI.